Good morning and thanks for joining us today for a webinar looking at secure remote access and how we can rethink the way that we approach that in order to increase security and user convenience. My name is Shona Bradshaw and I'm Marketing Communications Manager for Byte Security Partnerships. I'm delighted to be joined today by um, Ian Perry from Zscaler, who's going to be taking you through the um, crux of the, the technical elements of the presentation. So just a, a very quick overview of what we're going to cover today. So well, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping first of all, and, and then I will introduce you briefly to Bytes. I will keep it very brief, as many of you do know us already. Um, I'll introduce Ian and Zscaler. Um, and Ian will be taking you through today, looking at some of the challenges of applying 90s technology to 2018 remote access challenges. Um, looking and introducing a new approach to secure remote access, which says Scaler are pioneering in the industry, and then take you through a demonstration of, of how um, their Z Scaler private access um, solution works before an interactive Q&A. So a little bit of housekeeping for today's session. Um, attendee lines will be on mute throughout the presentation, but of course we do welcome questions and interaction throughout the webinar. Please post those questions via the chat or the questions box and I'll post them all to Ian at the end of the presentation. Um, for the purposes of today, we won't be getting into commercials, etc., on any solutions. We will keep the discussions to business challenges and strategy and solutions. Um, of course, those um, conversations are more than welcome via your Bytes account manager, uh, you know, after the, the actual webinar session itself. Um, we do have a recording available, we'll be recording today's session, um, so we'll make, make sure that those are distributed along with the presentation slides um, to all attendees today. Uh, and lastly, a brief request from me, um, we always want to make sure that the webinars are more um, relevant and useful to yourselves and the increase in, in what they're delivering for you. So there is a short five question feedback survey at the end of today's session. If you could take a minute after the presentation to fill it in, it would be much appreciated. So who are Bytes? Um, who are we? So we are the security specialist um, company within the Bytes um, technology group. So they're a part of the two billion allied electronics group. Um, we really aim to marry up the resources that you can expect from the largest companies, you know, the, the stability you can expect from a multinational with real security specialism. So we only focus on security, we have done for over 16 years. And that leads us to be able to really focus on those particular challenges in the marketplace and provide a very specialist level of support. Um, we like to consider we're like the, the, the small friendly sister within a, a very large organization that you can trust. Um, so we really pride ourselves on technical development and technical resource. We have in-house support available for all the solutions that we um, we recommend and we install and a, and a suite of consultancy services as well. Um, what we the areas and we work, it's right across the spectrum of information security from the next generation firewall through web and email content security, DLP, um, remote access, cloud and mobility security. And so that's where we work and, and what we aim to provide and what we provide and offer to companies and um, within those areas is the technical <coughs> expertise behind those solutions. So there's, we offer support as I've mentioned, we do technology mapping, projects, scoping, security strategy development um, and we aim to provide you with real insight into the technologies that you should be using to future proof your business and excellent support in actually deploying those. That's enough about us. What are we here to talk to you about today? Um, so remote access VPN, it really is the ultimate 90s child just like myself. Um, Unfortunately, it has inherited, uh, you know, there is it's quite infamous for very different challenges, user experience being one of them. You know, in an area and in an age where user expectations of remote access are so much higher than 20 years ago, um, the remote access VPN, the static VPN, really does, you know, it do not deliver in terms of the, the convenient user experience. What's more, um, in an area where people are adopting cloud technology, et cetera, it delays and it, you know, it conflicts upon cloud deployments, et cetera. At the same time, I mean, as a security specialist company, we're, we're speaking to businesses about the actual security risks when exposing your network to remote users rather than having a seamless experience. And so I'm gonna hand over to Ian. Um, Ian's going to look um, and explain through a new approach that utilizes the cloud itself 
in order to provide a, a better user experience and a more secure user experience whilst um, you know providing a more cost effective solution than lots of different appliances everywhere. Um, Ian is the Emerging Technology Engineer at Zscaler, so absolutely delighted to have him along today to take you through their solution suite. Uh, we've been working with Zscaler for some years now, and they are really pioneering a cloud-first approach to web security and access. Um, they're really, you know, very well-established security as a service specialist, pr protecting, you know, millions and millions of organisations globally, um, and, and really trying to evangelize the benefits of a cloud first approach in terms of cost efficiency and increasing security so with that in mind i'm going to be handing over to ian now um, you'll be hearing ian and i will mute myself off for the rest of the presentation before i come back and ask your questions to ian at the end thank you over to ian thank you very much indeed and good morning thank you all for attending so my intention today really is to walk through four different sort of areas of the way in which we're approaching secure private access. So the first thing I'll do is talk a little bit about who we are as Zscaler, or Zscaler, depending on whether you're looking at the American term or not, followed by the problem we're trying to solve, what private access actually is, how it works, and why you think customers will benefit from this approach, uh, and then finally show you this working. I think, you know, a, a picture tells a thousand words, and if I can actually show you this, that will certainly be beneficial. So if you look at it from a Zscaler perspective, um, really we operate in two different spheres of, of the cloud world, so to speak. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see our Zscaler internet access. And um, essentially this is our ability to deliver clean internet uh, uh, capabilities for users uh, and expose software as a service, Office 365, and the sort of more traditional uh, internet-facing solutions that you would see in the market. Now, the reason I would add this during a private access uh, presentation is that if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, this is actually the, the other solution that we have, both of which are designed and built in the cloud and for the cloud and designed around being delivered as a service as opposed to what you would traditionally see in terms of uh, maybe appliance or other kinds of capability. So what happened is effectively, and this is where the birth of private access took place, is the large enterprise organizations that we have worldwide turned around to us and said, okay, if you're securing the internet, can you help us to expose our private applications in a secure fashion and preserve user experience? Because when we look at it today, when I go to Salesforce, when I go to these external SaaS applications, I don't have a concept of needing to understand how I'm connecting to the network and some of those other capabilities. So fundamentally what I'll be talking about today is the right-hand side of this equation, which is the secure private access proposition. So when we look at it as a solution as a whole, what we're trying to do is the following, really. So the first thing is it's secure access to applications in data center and cloud. So think of this as, if you like, um, a philosophy about when you expose an application, you shouldn't really need to worry about where that application is, but you should be able to securely access it. So when I say data center and cloud, private applications, as we'll see later in the presentation, move. They can be exposed in different ways. That's fundamentally what private access is designed to do. The second thing that we're doing here, which is very important to understand in the migration and if you like the progression of secure remote access services, is we're authorizing on a specific application basis. And again, when I talk about what this means later on, essentially it gives you very granular control of applications and a number of use cases where discussions with yourselves will then help around things like third party access, mergers, acquisitions, et cetera, et cetera. The third thing we're trying to do is fast and seamless access. In other words, the user shouldn't have to worry about how they're connecting to something, they should just be able to connect to it. And in doing so, we then divorce the operational requirements of a business from what the end user experiences. And ultimately, what this, what this sort of fundamentally achieves, therefore, is not only a, a, a much more elastic and seamless way of accessing applications, but also a significantly reduced appliance footprint not just in terms of what you need to purchase to extend your remote access, but also in terms of the operational flows, overhead, and management of those different solutions. Okay. So I'll come back to this after we've talked about private access, but just to, to establish very early on some of the key use cases that we have, and one of the reasons software-defined perimeter, which I'll describe in a second, is so important. So first and fundamentally at the bottom here, you can see the concept of what we see as the software-defined perimeter for secure remote access. 
This is designed as a mechanism to give remote access to users and is designed so that it's extensible across these different environments that I've just described. But there are three other main use cases that we see across the enterprise user space. So that's uh, exposure of cloud application access, whether that's in Azure or other hosted environments, for example. Uh, from a mergers and acquisitions perspective, how we can dramatically reduce the time whereby you're able to combine network and user-based access and application access without the need for full network integration. So much more flexible. That also works for divestiture, for example, as well. But fundamentally, one of the key ones here is this idea of partner access. And as you'll see, the software-defined perimeter lends itself very, very cleanly to avoiding things like lateral movement and some of the risks associated with a more traditional VPN approach. One thing I would call out here is that we are a, a Microsoft partner. Uh, this year at the Ignite conference, um, Yosef Khalidi and our CEO, Jay Chowdhury, were up on the main stage talking about private access for two main reasons. I mean, first and foremost, this is a mechanism that helps to drive the adoption uh, of Azure and other elastic cloud services, which is evidently something that we both want to see. But also, we believe that this software-defined perimeter is leading the edge of the way in which you change the whole concept of remote access, but in a way that utilizes existing capabilities. In other words, we're not sort of reinventing the wheel to a certain extent here, but we are delivering remote access using standardized technology approach but without requiring a change in the way that you operationally manage that kind of capability. So this fundamentally is the problem that we're trying to solve. So for the last 10, 12 years or so, we've used traditional remote access technology. And I'm gonna to talk to this in two ways. I'll talk of it from the user experience perspective, and then I'll differentiate and talk about what it means to manage these environments. So the first thing you see here is, essentially I'm gonna build an inbound gateway of a number of these components. You may not have all of them, but there is a distinct likelihood that you have a number of these in order. And consequently, what I'm doing effectively is I'm asking the user to understand how to connect to the network, and then bringing them down through this stack of security controls, each one of which has to be configured or managed according to that user's requirements. And then once they emerge, in this case, to, 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 to get to SAP access from a private application perspective, they are now placed on the network. So from the user's experience perspective, that means I have to understand how I'm connecting to a different application. I, in some cases, need to understand whether I'm connecting to a different part of the world to do this. And essentially, I think that's, that's something we, we are familiar with, but is not necessarily the best way to solve this problem, specifically not from the user's perspective. From an operations perspective, you have to dimension all of this. You have to worry about the, the performance, the throughput, the time it takes to configure each of these different components in order to allow that user access. But fundamentally, having exposed the network to the user, that is the biggest risk in this environment, because what you then enable is the potential for lateral movement. So you could be looking at, I don't know, no petcher or things like target or uh, as, as a particular version of a breach whereby a third party was given this kind of access. So that's where we are today. So users experience is not necessarily brilliant operations are, are relatively significant overhead. So let's then extend this to the world that we know that, know that we now live in. So I now want to take these applications and I want to make use of some kind of elastic architecture, whether that be moving to Azure, another cloud, et cetera, et cetera. And in doing so, I have two fundamental approaches to fix this problem. The first one is I'm gonna build infrastructure into that cloud instance, which to a certain extent, that, that site to site VPN approach does work. Essentially, what it means, though, is I'm extending the problem that I already have, and I'm building that out to the cloud. Um, secondly, from a user's experience, performance tends to suffer more in these environments, and it becomes more complex to manage traffic and, and the exposure of the applications. What I would ask you to consider here, though, is there's also another problem. Now, this is assuming, this diagram, that I have one other cloud environment that I wish to expose. So what happens in a digital world where we start to look at different workflows, different workloads, uh, different cloud environments, essentially what you're asking the organization to do or you're being challenged to as security is reproduce that gateway in each of those different environments so that you can enable access to that cloud without building that expensive site-to-site -site VPN. So from a user experience perspective, we'd say that this potentially suffers from a, 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 an operations and actual infrastructure expense and overall agility within the business, also we're suffering here. And albeit I'm not necessarily, you know, knocking anyone's VPN implementation, generally 
this is the experience that we find across a, a larger number of the users that use traditional VPN. Um, I need to understand where I am, as I keep saying. Uh, likewise, when something goes wrong, it's very difficult for me to understand or diagnose where that particular issue has taken place. So moving onwards then, if we look at the market today and we look at the way in which businesses are trying to make use of more digital resources uh, to do more development and DevOps in the cloud and to move to those elastic environments, there are fundamentally a few changes here. So I mean, it, essentially, we understand these applications are moving. There's a significant benefit to doing that. Evidently, I think that is a trend, but it's a transformation. So at Zscaler, we believe that transformation is very, very significantly underway, but we don't expect a business to have moved everything to the cloud or indeed have everything in a private data center. The whole concept of what we're producing and, and proposing here is that you're able to undertake that at a pace to match your development needs as a business. The second thing we could say here is that from a network perspective, that then becomes more of a significant challenge. So we looked on the previous slides about building to a cloud environment and the challenges there. Fundamentally, though, what we've seen is a progression, and that is that the, the, the user left the building, the application left the building, but the network didn't. So in the traditional model, we're, we're trying to use these flexible, mobility-driven solutions, and in doing so, we're then coming back to the network and trying to backhaul and traffic manage everyone in that way. So we believe that's another one of these progressions, is that you are moving from a hub and spoke to a direct to cloud or direct to net methodology, but that again is a transition as we move to a zero trust model around the network. And what I mean by that is, you know, you don't trust the network infrastructure, but you manage the identity and the application access separately. Fundamentally, though, looking at that from a security perspective, and we are a security company, what I don't want to do is to bypass or remove any of the security capabilities that you have in place. So private access is designed to manage this in a manner that still enables you to apply policies to user and application but we're not fundamentally asking you to remove your firewalls, IDS, IPS, DLP, or any of the other capabilities that you may already have deployed outside of the internet stack sitting within the private data center. So I think we've talked a little bit about the, the, the market. We've talked a little bit about the, the problem potentially that we're facing. What I'd li now like to talk about is what Zscaler Private Access actually is so that we can have a conversation around you know, what this, this means. So, there are four key security tenets that we built this security solution on. Now, the first one of which is connecting users to applications without ever bringing them onto the network. So there are two terms that I'll use during this presentation. The first one I've used a little is the software defined perimeter. The other that I'll talk about is application micro segmentation. So first of all, let's take the software defined perimeter. The concept of a software defined perimeter is that it effectively divorces application access and identity from the network. So in its simplest form, what I'm saying is, when you as a user sitting there with your machine in front of you right now, try and access an application in my organization, you don't need to know where that application is. You're not connecting to an IP address, you're connecting to a service or an application, and I can move that application, I can be elastic with it, I can improve performance, I can do fundamentally whatever I want to do as a business, but you as the user accessing that are never placed in my environment. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's so important. So the next thing that we talk about then is we never expose applications without authorizing you as the user. So this is predicated on me using your identity provider to determine who you are before I provide any degree of access. So this is the second term, application micro-segmentation. What I mean by that is any time somebody accesses an application, they are independently authorized across this solution, and we then manage that application differently according to the policy you want in place. So this isn't like a traditional VPN where I have a, an IP address on the network and then I write access control lists and I try and manage everyone's access to these applications. The idea of micro-segmenting applications is each individual access to an application is controlled separately. Why is that important? It's important because when I look at defining an application, which I'll talk about in a second, I can give, for example, a third-party user access to a specific server in your environment but only the application that they're developing. I don't need to give them network access, I'm reducing risk, and I'm reducing the, the amount of control and the amount of operational complexity in bringing someone into the environment and enabling them to, them to access applications. 
So what's an application for us? Just important to sort of point this out at this point. So an application for us is any client server, TCP or UDP based device, uh, application, sorry. So that could be thick client, thin client, web, RDP, SIFS. The whole concept of the software defined perimeter is we're gonna allow you all of these different kinds of access. What we also do, number three, is we segment these applications without segmenting the network. So as you will see when I talk about how this works and what it does, we are in a position to enable you to very quickly expose these applications to users, but we're not gonna have a conversation with networking, operations and security, or your cloud ops guys running AMIs in AWS, for example, to change the way they behave. The idea of the software defined perimeter is that you're able to overlay that environment for remote access without going back and re-engineering everything as you do so. And the fourth point that we're making here, so provide remote access over the internet without VPN. This is somewhat more of a progression, but essentially what I would ask you the question is this. When you consider um, a cloud hosted application and you are sitting and accessing it on the corporate network as a user, are you remote to that application? So the idea here is when we provide remote access VPN, that remote access extends not just from a mobility perspective, not just because you could be on any device outside the organization, but also when you're remote to the application. In other words, you haven't built that infrastructure to that particular location, we can still expose that. So the consequence of software defined perimeter over time is actually a benefit to the business again. So I may have an identity that says you're third party or something else or whatever else, but I have a concept of a user. So the idea of being a corporate user, a mobile user, an iOS connected user, it sort of evaporates. You can deal with one person, their productivity within your business, and then drive the conversation in that manner. So looking at this in a little bit more detail and, and trying to understand how these different components work, what I'll do is I'll talk through the three key components of Zscaler Private Access so that you understand what each of them does and, and their behaviors. Then I'll talk you through what a user's access to this will look like. Then I'll talk you through what the operations piece of that looks like from, from your organization's perspective. So fundamentally, there are three component parts to the Zscaler Private Access. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, down here we have what we call our Z app. So Z app is a lightweight uh, piece of software that installs as an application on your Mac, PC, iOS, or Android device. It is capable of consuming both the ZIA internet access and the private access at the same time, just to make that point. So the two solutions for us are integrated at the user interface. ZApp's view of the world is that it builds an encrypted tunnel, an infrastructure tunnel to our cloud. It understands how to identify and authorize the user, and it understands how to intercept applications that you consider within your organization to be private. That's all it does. So from a user perspective, having logged into the application for the first time, as you will see in just a moment when I do the demonstration, that then just sits in the background and you never really need to go back and do anything with it again other than reauthorize. So that's, that's the first component. The second component here, if you look at the top of your screen here, there's that little American style two pin plug icon. That's what we call our Z connector. So again, a Z connector um, really is a lightweight virtual machine that sits anywhere in an environment that you want to expose cloud applications or applications, private applications or cloud. So there are three things you need to understand about the connector. And, and one of these is probably the fundamental thing that you would then understand from a software defined perimeter. So the connector understands how to connect to the application. It understands how to resolve internal and external DNS and makes an outbound connection to our cloud. Now that is the key point here. At no point when you use Zscaler Private Access are you ever advertising anything about that environment to the outside world. So when we looked at the perimeter, the whole idea of coming in through some kind of connector uh, and then going through a RAS solution and then DLP and DDoS and all of these other components, this solution is an outbound connection from that cloud environment. So at its lowest level, all you need is a port 443 connection outbound to that cloud and you can expose an application from anywhere. Once you understand that, the whole flexibility of the solution, et cetera, becomes much cleaner. So I'll talk a little bit in just a second about how this works, as I just said. The third component, therefore, is the, the Zen, this, this cloud icon that you can see in the middle of the screen. 
So this is the brokerage and it does three things fundamentally. It understands how to talk to the IDP so that we can manage the user and identity. It understands how to apply policy. So this is the whole application, micro segmentation, et cetera, that we described at the beginning. And it understands how to do availability and reachability of the applications that you want to expose. So those are the three things it does fundamentally. So if you look at it from a user's perspective, let's say, for example, you're sat there, you've, you've logged into your Z app, you're making your first connection to the service, so to speak. I, I try and access, which is something.intranet.mycompany.com. So this might have been a URL that was sent to me via email. It's a new application. It's a colleague sending me a link to the intranet or a page that they want me to look at. Okay. What happens at this point is we intercept the DNS request. We then go to the cloud. We say, is this user authorized? In other words, are they able to see this? Um, then we go back and we say, okay. And then we say, can I see that application? Now, this is at this point, the connectors in your environment go, can I resolve intranet.mycompany.com? Let's say for argument's sake, in this instance, the data center on the top right-hand side of your screen there says, I can see the application, okay? At which point we then broker those two connections and the user makes native access connection. In other words, they just get the internet. The reason why that's so important is if you look at it from a client's perspective, I am effectively saying to you, if you click a link to Salesforce, you go to Salesforce over the internet. If you click a link to intranet, you go to the intranet over private access. But at no point do you need to worry about how you're accessing that application. We worry about the policy as an organization. We worry about how we micro-segment you. We worry about where you get access from. All of those good things are built into the policy, but fundamentally the user experience is seamless. And that's what we try to preserve. So the ACID test to this is we talked about transformation and moving applications. And say for example, that you are going through a transformation process. And one of those things that you want to do within that transformation process is to move the intranet site that we just accessed and move that up into the Azure cloud, okay? So normally we'd be sitting here and be saying, okay, right, now I need to go through change control. I need to understand the IP address of the server. I need to understand VLANs, I network identity, firewall rules, and all the good things that we'd need to understand to do this. Fundamentally, with private access, what I do is I, I work to move the intranet content to Azure. Once the connector can resolve intranet in, in the Azure environment, nothing changes for the user. They are still accessing the same application, but we have determined during that process that that application is now resident within another location within the organization as a whole. So that's the fundamental benefit of a software-defined perimeter. So what are we not? Okay, we're not a proxy, we're, we're not an application layer gateway, and we're not acting on plugins. So we're not installing anything on your servers. The connector is a standalone virtual appliance. One connector will expose all applications in a location if that's what you want to do. We're not intercepting anything or changing anything or adapting any of your traffic. So anything you have as an application that's client server will run over the solution without needing to be sort of worrying about versions of SAP, thin client, thick client, and all the other good stuff that goes in line with that. <coughs> Sorry, fundamentally as well, we're allowing any of these applications. So from a, a systems engineering stroke systems administration perspective, we're supporting RDP, Telnet, SSH. From a user's perspective, we're supporting all of the usual sort of um, email, et cetera, et cetera, that you would normally choose to have there. And then from a third party perspective, we're giving you the ability to expose those applications in a very controlled and very easily configurable manner. So if you look at it, what we've talked about, just again, to sort of hammer this home, so to speak. First thing is the users are never placed on the network. So I'm not connecting to an IP address that significantly reduces risk in terms of north-south communication and that secure remote access piece. One of the key benefits here that I'll talk about in a little bit in terms of the use case is if you're undertaking a merger and acquisition, for example, one of the first things that you end up doing is having a conversation about how you link the two organizations together and how you can get people using things like timesheets or finance or, or learning about the two companies, for example. And you generally sort of drop a firewall between the two of them and then you try and manage overlapping address space. What I'm describing here is designed to avoid that. And we'll look at a use case in just a minute about how quickly you can leverage software defined perimeter to enable you to expose third party and mergers and acquisition. The next thing that's fundamentally important to this, because you're not getting network access, unless you know about an application, unless you have authorization to it, 
nothing is exposed. And for that reason, lateral movement, the risk around applications, the risk around how you control where your users consume applications. So for example, if I'm mobile on my home iOS device, I can get intranet, I can maybe do other things. If I'm actually sat on a corporate managed asset, then I can consume those other applications. But again, it's a seamless configuration between those two. Policy is an interesting question. So two things I'd like to define and, and sort of explain here. The first thing we can do is we can act in a, a discovery mode. So for want of a better term, describing this as the CASB for private applications. What it enables me to do, instead of getting really complicated very quickly or doing very detailed policy, we can act in the same manner that you would act as a traditional VPN, but enable the capabilities of the software defined perimeter as part of the solution. So for example, Say you have um, a, a rule set that says star.company.com, I will then learn all of the application access from the user base and you can then choose to be more restrictive going forward. But from an introduction perspective and from an operations perspective, bringing the solution online, it's low risk because we're not breaking anything. We're just allowing the users to access as they already have been in their traditional fashion. The next thing, though, is that you can then become more restrictive because it's application based access. If you need multi factor authentication for certain applications, et cetera, et cetera, all of that can be built into the software defined perimeter. The second thing I'd like to argue here, and I'll show you this within the demo, is when you look at a traditional VPN from an operations perspective, if you get a phone call from someone at home saying, I can't access this application, there is generally quite a long winded process you need to go through to try and figure out what's broken. Because micro segmentation is designed to individually manage the access of individual applications, we can then give you very quick root cause analysis to fix those problems as well. So I will come back to that when I look at the interface. And the last bit here is the internet is, is the new network. Um, because you're deploying Zapp, I don't mind now, <coughs> subject to policy, if you're sitting in a, a Starbucks or anywhere in the world that you're consuming some of these applications. So the, the impact to user satisfaction, user productivity, agility, the ability for you to operationally manage your applications and, and that productivity dramatically increased by the adoption of a software defined perimeter. So there are a few use cases that we can deploy here and I say these, these are ones that are, are quite interesting to understand. When you look at a corporate user traditionally you need to consider potentially how they are remote to the cloud application and likewise from mobile users needing to consume internal applications as well as the cloud. This becomes a ubiquitous approach to application access from within the organization. And it's a very simple deployment. And again, it's, it's what I've already described to this point. The next thing you can do then is you can say, right, OK, I now need third party access and I need to manage them differently. But they still need to be able to get to my cloud apps for time billing, for example, and or manage or develop resources within inside the organization. So this again is all predicated on the ZAP exposure. And the last use case then is what do I do around client lists and how do I manage third party browser based access, et cetera, et cetera, to each and every one of these capabilities. So what I'm describing here is the, the access methodology use case. You could literally take all of these four different components and providing they're on your IDP, collapse them into one concept of users and the identity drives the access mechanism not the network or the location or the fact that you've got software installed. So what have I talked about here? I mean, that's quite a lot of ground to cover in this sort of 25 minutes or so that we've spent on it so far. So experience, I said at the beginning, it's all about user experience and operational agility and experience. On the one hand, the user doesn't need to worry about where the application is. They just need to know that they can access it and that that looks native. From an operations perspective, if I need to add applications, control them, there are two really key takeaways here. The first one is I can do that more easily from an identity based solution. So I can say uh, Ian in engineering uh, now working as a third party contractor has access to these three applications only. Done deal. So in terms of the policy configuration, it's all driven by the IDP. But there's another component part of that as well that I think is very important. Everything we describe in this solution is real time. So it's a real user accessing a real application in real time. Nothing is synthetic about the way we're delivering the solution. So if you think about your VPN solution today, and you think about the policy set and the access control lists that you've got there. And from my experience running managed services, 
sitting there and trying to look at the 300 access control lists and not really understanding at that point the legacy part of that, you know, how we got there over those 10 years. The experience from an operations perspective is here, you can very quickly determine whether those policies are still needed and again, remove them and manage them up to date. From security, uh, we're not asking you to change anything. Remember the connector is outbound connectivity from the cloud and the app is lightweight. So if you want to segment your data center, manage the different ways in which those applications are segmented around things like PCI or other compliance, then the connector can incorporate itself into that environment without compromising anything. So again, we're not asking you to install plugins on servers or do anything along those lines. Cost-wise, this is a transformation argument as well. I'm not going to talk about cost today, but from a general perspective, there are three threads that I would look at here. The first one is we looked at the gateway at the beginning. So do I need to build those more complex and expensive gateways for inbound access? The second is less tangible, but for example, if I have a gateway that's running on servers sitting in a software environment, who's responsible for it and how is that managed? So the whole intangible operations efforts that are required there, we've seen, for example, in some cases, taking change control from 15 steps down to about four. But then again, that's entirely down to your own experience. And the last thing is this is a service and it's based on, on users. So multiple devices are incorporated, et cetera, et cetera. I think the last thing here is, is really quite important to understand as well. I mean, a typical POC build process for us is under two hours. If you can demonstrate that, and if we can work with you to demonstrate that, then hopefully we're in a position to make this simple. The whole idea of the software defined perimeter is that the user experience is improved and operationally it's much easier to manage. So a couple of different examples here. So we have an American health company with 130,000 employees. They wanted to replace the VPN and merge with another healthcare manufacturer. So in a traditional model, you would have expected that to be a very long-winded and complicated process. And there are three drivers for this. I mean, the first one is um, from a risk and compliance perspective, after the ink's dried on the contract, they were then sitting there saying, well, we need to reach security parity to our risk stance within 100 days. Otherwise, we're going to be outside of our insurance, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing was the whole user experience and management of those users in that environment. So that's, again, I think a very key concern. So what we were able to do is manage that process, and this is the third thing, interface ourselves into that process, and in a period of four weeks, migrate 55,000 users to having access to the parent company's applications using that lightweight access. Consequently, they were able to achieve parity well within the 100 days and were then in a position during that M&A process to make much more uh, sort of less rushed decisions about the further integration of other systems because the users were already being productive. So that's just an example of a large user base moving them across. They don't need the VPN to get to their Office 365. That's delivered over our internet access product. But again, they didn't actually have to manage and migrate across all of those networks. It was a huge cost saving. Uh, another one here would be basically um, a technology company. Basically, they sell online. What the idea behind this particular use case was they, they were relying very heavily on any third party access for VPN into the solution. So as they are building and developing these different technology solutions, a myriad of different people are contributing to that. So it's a, a true digital economy play. And what they were able to do then basically is step back from a very complex process in VPN and implement what I described earlier, which is policy-based access to applications with the ZApp installed on these third parties, hence your productivity increases, and DevOps can move workloads around the place and quite quickly make best use of that resource. So you're not wasting cycles with people that are in a, in a dev environment that aren't actually delivering anything, put it that way. So we've talked a little bit about secure access to applications in the data and center and cloud. We've talked about the software defined perimeter. We've talked about authorized access. We've talked about the micro segmentation. We've talked about the concept of it being fast and seamless. And we also talked about that reduced appliance footprint in terms of the overall expense and cost of building out these solutions. I said I'd cycle back to this very briefly. Um, evidently, those of you that are looking at the recordings, as I've described, in the previous two use cases, we had a, a cloud, an m &A example, sorry, and a third party access example. These are not discrete solutions. What I mean to say by this is 
when we're talking to for yourselves or looking at one particular solution in partner access we often end up then sort of pivoting to a cloud application access or pivoting back to what the VPN experience is within the organization. So they're not exclusive, they become one part, if you like, of the overall software-defined perimeter um, capability. Now on that note, I'm gonna run a, a literal two to three minute demonstration of an RDP connection and then an application connection into the environment. So if I just come out of this presentation and pop myself back over into what will be my now logged out, um, Sorry, one second. Uh, instance, paste, plug myself in. What you're looking at on your screen here is the cloud component. This is the broker, it's where we do all the policy configuration, etc., etc. There are three main areas that are important to this. So you have the concept of applications. Remember, during the presentation, I talked about discovered applications. Uh, this is our SE environment, so don't worry, there's nothing proprietary in this at all. But each of these applications have been discovered dynamically by a user in our organization attempting to access them within our environment. The second thing I can do is this is all user-based. So I'll come back to this in a moment and I'll explain how this works. But essentially, instead of being a VPN connected user with network access, I am now a user which can give me granular visibility of every application that I have accessed. And then likewise, I also said from a health perspective, from a root cause analysis perspective, what we can do with this is we are able to come back in here and start to give you graphical representation of how your applications are actually delivered within your organization on an individual application basis as well. And this builds out, if you like, to modeling I'll just give, quickly show you this now, one of these. Uh, modeling, for example, all of the applications in a given environment and the permissions and controls that they have. So what I want to do here very quickly, and this will take about two, three minutes, is uh, first and foremost, the Safe March environment that I'm looking at here is not publicly addressable. It doesn't exist in the wider world. And you will see from the top of my screen here, I'm not currently running private access. So just to prove negative first, if I attempt to connect to a server inside that environment, I'm, I'm trying to run an RDP session to a resolved server. I can't see anything, therefore I'm not able to access anything. So that's your, your, your proof of failure there, if you like. If I then come back here and I fire up a browser, and likewise I happen to have, oh, thank you very much Firefox for installing any update during a webinar, brilliant. There we go, here we go. So I have a concept of what we call our, our customer relationship management software, which is actually crm.safemarch.com. Likewise, if I'd sat there and you'd sent me this link at home, because I'm not connected to private access, and that's an intranet hosted application, I can't see anything. So what I'll now do, uh, just clearing this so that I don't end up caching anything, and I hope that will go away, good, is I will now fire up the Zscaler private access app. So you will see the icon appear in the top corner here. If I open this, you will see here that I am currently configured to the IDP for SafeMarch, I'm connected to the private access service and I am authenticated to that service. So what this means is, if you were looking at this from a ZIA private uh, and private access, you would have ZIA here and private access would be an additional function. But once you've done this, once you've logged in and authenticated, that will sit in the sys tray on your, on your PC or it'll sit up in the background here. So what I'll now do is I'll go back and I'll attempt to do exactly the same thing that I did just a minute ago. What I want to do is I want to be able to access this server in SafeMarch. So negotiate credentials, so remember, my behavior hasn't changed. Because I was now connected to private access, this RDP session is going to sit there, and I can now remotely log into that machine in that environment. Likewise, uh, he says, just waiting for this to decide to go away. Here we go. Right. If I come back here and I do the same thing for the CRM application, give me a second. Here we go. So I attempt to turn to crm.safemarch.com. And, oh, no, it's always a demo item happening somewhere. Here we go. Let's get rid of this and I'll come over here because I'm not cached. Beg your pardon. Second. I'll do it from here. Give me a second. Okay. There we go. That's fantastic. That did work. CRM access suite is sitting inside our environment. So now I'll come back here. I said in the beginning the applications can be discovered. And the user perspective of this is very, very important in terms of the software defined perimeter. So if I look at connected users, you can now see that I'm connected here. If I look at this, 
let me give it just a few seconds, you will see now on this side, there's my CRM access. If I scroll down a bit, you should see in a moment a server one as well. What this means though, is unlike a traditional VPN, what I've been able to do is I can give you visibility of when you connected, what policy you hit, who you were, where you were, how you traversed the cloud, what connector you connected to, including the private IP address inside the environment that you were connecting from, and I can tell you which access of application you were trying to access. So think of that from a sort of root cause analysis. This is micro segmentation in action. What I've done is I've been given authorization to that one particular application, and from an ops perspective, I can move that as we described earlier. From a support perspective, I can very quickly come in here and tell you what's wrong. So just to quickly look at an error. Um, so, oh no, got it. we'll leave that for the time being, I think. I think these errors are slightly outdated. Anyway, so on, on that note, um, just like to leave you with one final thought, and that is when you're considering the concept of what this private access means, the benefit to the business, the benefit to the user, and the benefit to yourself is that operational simplicity and the fact that you can expose applications from anywhere. On that note, I think I'd best be handing back to Q&A. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks very much, Ian, for your um, detailed presentation. I'd just like to invite the audience to pose your questions to Ian. So if you just take it, I'll give it a minute or so to gather some questions. You can type those into the questions box and I'll pose your questions to Ian over the next few minutes. Thanks. Okay, um, Ian, so our first question for the audience is regarding two-factor authentication. Can you use multi-factor or two-factor authentication? Yes, indeed. Uh, very straightforward answer. Uh, we will consume multi-factor integration through the IDP that you support as part of this solution. That could be um, ADFS, it could be Azure AD, Okta, Ping, or indeed anything that is Shibboleth SAML version based. At that point, we are then able to integrate to the IDP, consume multi-factor authentication. For application access, that will be submitted as a SAML assertion that we can then act upon. But remember, this is native active application access. So if that multi-factor is required for authorization or, or access to an application within your environment, that would still be supported as well. Good question. Thank you. Okay, um, and related to that question, uh, I'm not quite sure what this means, but a question mark dual. Question mark what? Sorry. D U O dual. Is it dual with authentication? Yes, I, I, I think I know what I'm talking about there. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> okay, so apologies. That, that's my lack of technical <laughs> not knowledge. Right. Find out who it is and go back and talk to them. Okay, um, and then another question here: Can you map network drives? Okay, so yes, indeed, absolutely. So. So the, the methodology that I described during the presentation would enable you to resolve a network drive in, in, the, in the manner that you would do normally. That would, for example, integrate to Kerberos ticketing or other methods that you might use to do so. So yes, absolutely, that is designed around that. There is also the ability to map a network drive or application via IP address. The only thing to bear in mind there is in the event you decide to map via IP, not by FQDN, you're then in a position where the overlapping address space benefits and the flexibility can be somewhat reduced. So to make the best use of the software defined perimeter, yes, you can map a, a, a drive from an FQDM. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question here. Do you provide internet access and mail gateways as part of the Zscaler Cloud? Right, okay. So the answer to that question is any internet facing solution, SaaS or external capabilities there would be delivered through the ZIA component. <laughs> Now, splitting this apart, any application that you deliver as a private application, for example, something like Exchange, or any of those kinds of associated solutions could be delivered over private access so that you're leveraging your internal architecture. So think of the two things as, as, as sort of separate parts. If you're going to the internet, you're going to SaaS, and the distinction here is that you would never place a user in a SaaS environment anyway. You know, Salesforce.com don't give you an IP address and they don't enable you to actually go into their environment. You just access it then private access is the same thing through that other route. Hopefully that helps. 
Okay, um, and finally, um, can you use any port or protocol? Any port, any protocol, server, sorry, client to server. The only distinction here is, for example, multicast server to client connectivity won't work in this instance. So yes, the, the, the software defined perimeter and the way that we've implemented Zscaler private access is to enable any of these applications. So quite literally, thin, thick, client, SAP, any private application or any combination of those ports can be supported. Super. And then there was one question which I'm happy to answer. Someone just asked, is it, it will be a copy of the presentation now electronically? I can just confirm that, yes, of course, we'll send that as well as the recording. Absolutely. So I just want to take this uh, take a moment to thank Ian for you know his fantastic presentation today. Thank everyone for taking. Oh, apologies, I have one last question. Oh, there was always one. You have <laughs> time to take time to take it. Um, absolutely, there's always one. Is reporting available even if user access accesses the apps from the internal network? Absolutely, yes. So, so if you think about this, I can disable ZPA inside the organization for an application if that application is local to you and that avoids bringing the traffic out to the cloud and back to the internal organization. But increasingly what we're seeing is, you know, there are very few users that actually sit in the data center. So for that reason, you would expect ZPA becomes almost ubiquitous access to all of these different locations. And then the reporting is, is visible. So if you traverse the private access solution, I can report. If you bypass, then I can't unless you're going over the ZIA solution. That's the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. So now, um, I, obviously, I thank you for your time, Ian. I just want to take time to thank everyone for taking their time this morning to join us. I appreciate that, you know, given you have multiple priorities and things to look at at the moment. Um, you know, we do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to, you know, attend to these sessions. Um, but we do have a, a feedback survey at the end, so if you could take a, an extra second to fill it in, that would be fantastic. And lastly, I will make sure the recording is sent over to you um, early next week so you can share that um, with your team and also distribute that within your wider business. And um, thanks, everyone, and have a lovely morning. Thank you indeed.